What is up everybody? Today we're going to be talking about a pretty interesting paradox in statistics called Simpson's Paradox. And the best way I think to explain it is going through a couple examples. And I think more interesting than the paradox itself, which is not really a paradox once we get through it, it's just kind of an unexpected thing that can happen with data if you're not careful. The more interesting thing I think with all this is kind of the ethical concerns, where the more I get into data science and the more I work and learn about data science, you learn about ways that you can be misled by data. And then you think about that misleading being either unintentional, which is usually the case, people just miss something. But you also realize if you were a bad actor, if you were a villainous data scientist, you can actually use things like this to draw the conclusions you want to draw from data while seeming perfectly logically sound. And so we'll get to that by the end of the video, but first let's get into one example of Simpson's paradox. This first example is based on probably the most popular example of Simpson's paradox, which is the UC Berkeley gender bias in admissions data set. We're using a slightly modified, easier to understand version of that, but the real situation is pretty much identical to this, just with different numbers. So let's say that you are working at a university and you look at your admissions data from last year. You see that 1,000 men and 1,000 women applied to your university. The probability that you admitted someone, given they were a male, or the fraction of these 1,000 males that were admitted, was 42%. Now you do the same thing for the women. The probability that you would admit a woman, the fraction of these 1,000 women that were accepted, was 18%. Whoa, that is a striking difference. 18 is less than half of 42. And so just looking at this data, it's pretty striking. And the most obvious emotional and logical reaction here is that, hey, there is a gender bias in admission. We're only accepting 18% of our women, but we're accepting a whole 42% of the men. And so maybe based on this data, you launch some internal investigations or the news gets this story and it becomes a national headline and things kind of just go from there. But if we took an extra second to break down this data by a different confounding variable, the department to which people applied, then we would get the full story. So let's continue and look through it in that lens. Let's say there's just two departments at this university for simplicity, department A and department B. Department A accepts a whole 50% of people who apply there. It's, it's pretty open to accepting people. Department B, however, is very, very selective. Maybe it's a field that not a lot of people get into, there's not a lot of resources, and so they really only have to accept the best of the best. They only accept 10% of the people who apply. Now let's take a look at the applicants by gender. So let's say for department A, there's 800 male applicants. Now, because there's a 50% admission rate, 400, half of those get in. And let's say there's 200 women applicants to department A, and again, half of those or 100 get in. Now department B is basically just the remaining men and the remaining women would have applied there. So we see for department B, 200 men applied and 10% of those or 20 got in. And the remaining 800 women applied there and 10% of those or 80 women got in. So we see looking within each department, there is no bias in admissions. It accepts 50% of the men and accepts 50% of the women and department B accepts 10% of the men and 10% of the women. We do see where the bias is though, is that there's a gender bias in applications. So we see that 800 of the 1000 men applied to the department that's more likely to select anybody. And 800 of the 1,000 women apply to the department, which is just less likely to accept anybody, more highly selective. And so we see looking at these aggregate stats, we get the same stats as before. So what's the probability you were admitted given you're a male? So that's 420 people divided by 1,000 people or 42%, which is exactly what we got back here. What's the probability you were admitted given you're women? That's 180 people divided by 1,000 people or 18%, the same stat we got back here. So looking at these global statistics would imply there's some kind of gender bias in admissions, but looking at this breakdown by department shows us there's actually a bias. There is a gender bias, but it's not in admissions, it's in applications. Women are more likely in our hypothetical situation here and also in the UC Berkeley actual data to apply to those departments that are more highly selective. And because they self-selected themselves into those categories, they're less likely to get in which means that if we zoom out globally, the school ends up just accepting less women. 
But that's because this gender bias in applications has propagated, has flowed forward into a gender bias in admission. And so this is one of the primary examples of Simpson's paradox, which is that looking at data zoomed out paints a very different picture than looking at data zoomed in. And if we're not careful and don't do our homework and only look at one or the other, then we can draw incomplete conclusions. And so let's look at one more example here using continuous data instead of discrete variables like admitted or not admitted. Let's say that we ask a group of undergraduates and a group of graduate students to take a exam. Let's say a mathematics exam. Now we're just gonna assume here the undergraduate students are still learning, they're still trying to pick up the basic skills, whereas the graduate students might have more refined, more honed skills with their years of experience in studying. So we go ahead and ask them, hey, there's gonna be an exam tomorrow, you can study for it as long as you want, just tell us how long you studied. And so we're gonna measure how long they studied for the exam here on the x-axis, so hours studied, and we're gonna measure the final test score they got on the y-axis. Now we find for the graduate students, who are these red cluster up here, it does tend that if you study a little bit more, you do get a higher test score, so there is a positive correlation here. So we can just draw a line of best fit through our graduate student cluster here. Good enough. And if we ask the undergraduate students, how much did you study? And we see if they studied more, that does also lead to a positive correlation with test score. So we can draw a pretty good line of best fit right there. So if we ask each of these groups individually, the story is pretty clear. There's no causal relationship, of course, but we're just talking about correlations here. Is there a positive correlation with studying more and getting a higher score on the test? Yeah, absolutely there is. It's true for graduate students and it's true for undergraduate students. But if we were blind to the fact that there's two separate populations in this data, if nobody told us there's undergraduate students and graduate students in this data and asked us the same question, is there a positive or negative relationship between studying more and getting a higher test score, then we would just draw a line of best fit through the entire data, which would actually look like this. A pretty sound negative relationship, a negative correlation between studying more and test score. And let's dive a little bit deeper into why it's happening because there's not much going on here. It seems kind of obvious, but the idea is that graduate students are just more likely to get a higher test score anyways, because they're starting at kind of a higher baseline, maybe their level of education or knowledge or experience with these tests is just better. And so even those graduate students who aren't studying a lot are still doing really good on the test score relative to these undergraduate students who are studying a lot, who are still getting a lower test score than those people who didn't study in the graduate pile. Which leads to this really, really interesting situation. Again, just like before, where if we look at the data globally, it paints a negative relationship but if we look at the data locally or break it up into groups, then we get a positive relationship. So without grouping, you could say that more studying is negatively correlated with test score. Don't study, it's just gonna to lead to a worse score. But if you do group, then you see that within each group, more studying is positively correlated with test score. No matter who you are, an undergraduate or a grad student, if you want a better score on the test, then you should study more. It would be the conclusion there. And so Simpson's paradox, one of the biggest complaints about it is it's not a paradox at all. That's kind of marketing to some degree, but the paradox is that a global pattern can reverse if we split the data into groups. With the admissions data, we saw that that was the gender bias being in admissions versus applications. Here we see that it's the correlation being positive or negative based on whether we break it up into groups or don't break it up into groups. And so that's the basic idea of it, but I wanna spend a minute here talking about how this feeds into data ethics and how it feeds into how much you should trust the data and the conclusions that are out there. So we can kind of break this up into Simpson's paradox usually arises, people assume it because of unintentional consequences. You just forgot to take into account a confounding variable, the data scientist or the statistician just didn't account for something they should have accounted for. And once they account for it, they get the full picture. I think in 99% of the cases that is absolutely true. There's just so many variables and columns and so many ways you can look at data that you're bound to miss one here or there. And so that's totally okay, but it can lead to these unintended consequences. But it does kind of get me thinking about the intentional case. I'm gonna put on my data scientist supervillain hat for a second and look at both of these examples again. And I can draw whichever conclusion I want, maybe based on my own biases or who I work for or the agenda I'm trying to push by selectively looking at data in a certain way. For example, if my agenda is to show that people just need to study less and studying more actually just burns you out and leads to lower test scores and there's no point, then 
I would just not publish the fact that these are two distinct populations when I go and print this report. I would just say that, you know what, we did some kind of study and of all the participants, we saw there's a negative correlation between our studied and test score and that's the end of the day. Just like in this previous example, if my agenda was to push that there is a gender bias in admissions, then I would just look at the zoomed out data, even if I was aware of the zoomed in data and exactly what the full picture was. When I published this report, you could arguably, and with very little blood on your hands because people don't usually have access to the full data sets that things are published off of, they just have access to percentages and conclusions and correlations and things like that, you can say, hey, this university has a huge problem. We need to address this. Males are getting in at more than twice the rate that females are. And so you could spark a whole national conversation based on that. So that's something that I really want people to be aware of. I want to do a whole series on data ethics and how people can misuse data science and statistics for their own personal gains. But Simpson's paradox is certainly one of those high risk areas, if you ask me. So I'd urge you to take a closer look at the data, ask more questions about does the trend you're saying still hold up when you take into account some confounding variable that they didn't publish. That's just good data hygiene. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I will see you all next time.